My favorite thing to do in church is when sister, well, rather elder Tanya Watson says, it's time to walk around and hug each other. It's my favorite thing to do in church. Walk around and hug my brethren. Because if I'm having a bad morning and somebody hugs me with a big smile and I feel the joy, my whole day is is made, my entire day. It's amazing. And there's always somebody who does that. So thank you all for sharing your joy. Thank you all for sharing the peace in your heart and responding by saying, good morning, my brother. And we really feel it, man. We feel it. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so this is our fourth day in this two-week experience and edification of God's Word. It is a very exciting topic, the righteousness of God. And as you can see, from one verse, one verse, we have been delving into the truth of Scripture from one verse as we speak about one topic, the righteousness of God. From one verse, we spoke about the perfection of God's righteousness, the rectitude of God's righteousness. We spoke about the Hebrew word in the righteousness of God that relates to his justice, his love, his mercy. And this morning, we are going to be examining the final word that is of importance in this passage, which is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. The final word in this passage simply means upright. I'm going to read the passage again so that we can remember what it says. The rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. The Hebrew word, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say, but it means upright. It means without deformity, without crookedness, without imperfection without darkness, without unholiness. It is theology by negation where you use a negative term to describe the righteousness of God by saying it is without something. You are affirming what it is. This morning, we're going to be looking at God's righteousness from the perspective of his obligation. So the topic of this morning is the obligation of the righteousness of God. This simply means that because of who God is, and because he is devoted to his glory, he obliges himself to act in a certain way because of who he is. For example, in Psalm chapter 25, verse 8, it says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. You notice that it is because of who God is why he instructs sinners in the way. It is because he is good. It is because he is upright. It is because he is the Lord. And because of that, he instructs. When you put that in the perspective of the other attributes of God, we can say something like this. Because God is loving, he will treat his people with love. Because God is a providing God, he will provide his people with what they need. Because God is holy, he will do everything that is holy. Notice. It is because of who he is, why he acts in a certain way, why he does a certain thing, why he speaks a certain way, why he reveals what he has revealed in his word. And in this morning's lesson, as we look at the righteousness of God, we see that God, because he is righteous, 
he will act a certain way and do a certain thing because he obliges himself to do so. This Hebrew word appears more than 40 times in expressing something that is right in the eyes of God. We see in Exodus 15, verse 26, and he said, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of this disease on you. Notice the phrase, do what is right in his sight. The same word is used. It's also used again in Numbers 23, verse 27. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will be agreeable with God that you curse them for me from there. Notice that which is agreeable to God. He mentions that phrase. If it's agreeable to God, then that simply means it's right in the sight of God. We spoke about God's righteousness being the standard of holiness and righteousness. And we spoke about God being the standard of what is good. When we think about the righteousness of God based upon the obligation of God's righteousness, we see that because God is righteous, it permeates and obliges him to see a distinction between what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, because he always sees himself as the standard. And because God sees what is right and what is evil, what his righteousness also obliges him to do is to judge evil and to reward good. Brethren, we also see this in the word of God, in that God's word is upright, God's word is right, God's word is the standard of perfection and the standard of holiness, which is why when we follow his word, our lives can be described as righteous, holy, and good. This is how the Bible describes the word of God. In Psalm chapter 19, verse 8, the Bible says, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. We see another passage relating to God's word in Psalm chapter 33, verse 4. It says, for the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. So we see this Hebrew word used multiple times and it is translated upright. It is translated right. And it shows us that because of who God is, everything that comes from him, everything that he does, all his actions because he is obligated to glorify himself, because he is the highest good. We see this truth throughout scripture, that our God is righteous. Now, when we take this to the New Testament, and we think about the righteousness of God, from the perspective of his forgiveness of, of our sins and his act of salvation. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, it says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. From the perspective of salvation, brethren, because we are saved, because we are Christians, because we are children of God, because we are born again. 
we also have an obligation to follow God and to live a life of righteousness. But notice this key word in the text in 1 John 2, 29. Everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. This means that if you have a lifestyle of righteousness, a lifestyle of consistent righteousness, not a lifestyle of perfect righteousness, because none of us can have perfect righteousness in and of ourselves. Our actions will always have some shortcoming. But if we have a life that is characteristic of a practicing of righteousness, then this passage says that we are born of God. This gives us pause for a moment to examine ourselves. Does our lifestyle show a habit and a consistent behavior of righteousness? If the answer is no, then we have to repent. We have to turn from our sin. If the answer is yes, then we have reason for joy and we have reason to boast in God because of his holiness and because of his work in our heart. We see this again in 1 John 3, verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So we see... That God in his word identifies individuals in his kingdom who practice righteousness as being righteous. If you practice righteousness, you are identified by God as being an individual who is righteous. We have an obligation to follow God and to be righteous people in his kingdom and in this world. Because the opposite would bring dishonor to God. The opposite would bring a reason for blaspheming God's name by those who live in darkness. There are people who are not Christians, brethren, who constantly watch us, constantly observe our lives, constantly try to find some fault so that they can talk about how every single Christian is a dirty rich and is a wicked. When we think about God's righteousness and our obligation to that righteousness, it also causes us to think about what will happen if we don't follow God and follow his righteousness. If we love God and we love him with all our heart, our concern about how those in darkness view us and view our lives will be on our list of priorities. But sad to say, there are Christians to their shame who would like to say these words. I don't know what anybody wants to say about I don't care what nobody want to think about me. I don't care what anybody want to talk about. When we say words like that, it reflects a feeling of negligence and the feeling of being nonchalant about God's righteousness and how people view your life as it relates to God's righteousness. The Bible says that we are to shine our light in this world so that our God in heaven may be glorified, or rather our Father in heaven may be glorified, which gives us an obligation. God is obligated to follow the standard that is within himself, and we are obligated to follow the standard that is in God, which means that we are to care what people say about us and what people think about us, because if they can see in our life the righteousness of God, brethren, it will not only glorify God, but it will also be a starting point for them 
to view Christianity in the right way. And one day, by God's grace, turn from their sins and become fellow Christians. When we think about God's righteousness, God being unrighteous is inconceivable. That is why when Paul was speaking about this in Romans chapter 9, he said in verse 14, What shall we say? There is no unrighteousness with God, is there? And then Paul uses the greatest negative Greek word in all of Scripture. May it never be. Or God forbid. Is there right in is there unrighteousness with God? No. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Is there right unrighteousness with God? It is impossible, Paul says. There is no unrighteousness in God. That is why when Jesus was praying to God in John chapter 17, when he was praying to his father, he said these words in verse 25. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent to me. Notice the words of Jesus, O oh, righteous Father. God is righteous. There is no unrighteousness in him. And because he is righteous, he always does the right thing. Because his righteousness is perfect. Because there is rectitude in his righteousness. He is obligated to be righteous. But not only is God the Father righteous, but Jesus Christ is righteous. When Peter was speaking about Jesus in Acts chapter 3 verse 14, Peter said these words. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. In Acts chapter 7, verse 52, the Bible says, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. And finally, in Acts chapter 22, verse 14, the Bible says, And he said, The God of our fathers who has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. The Bible constantly calls Jesus Christ the righteous one. The one who is perfectly righteous. The one who is truly righteous. The one who never sinned. A few days ago, I said that the only being in this entire world or the only being in existence who has the right to judge anyone is God. And when we judge someone, we are not judging someone as the judge. We are judging in the sense that we are announcing what the judge has said. We also see that when God punishes sin and when God justifies sinners, he is performing an act of righteousness. In Romans 3, verse 26, the Bible says, For the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is God speaking about the death of Christ. When Christ died on the cross, when Christ took upon himself the sins of all those who would believe and God, as the Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 10, it pleased God to crush him. The Bible says that 
God's wrath fell upon Christ. Christ drank the cup of God's wrath. When God punished sin, God performed a righteous action. But this also says that in his act of justifying us, he is righteous in that action as well. What do I mean by that? When God, through your faith, declares you righteous on the basis of all the righteous deeds and works that Jesus Christ did in his life, God is performing an act of righteousness. Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The King James Version might say he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But both of them mean the same thing because the Greek word that is used there means just and it means righteous. So when God forgives us of our sins, when we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is righteous when he performs the action of forgiving. And why is that? He's faithful because he is a forgiving God and he will be who he is. And he is righteous because Christ took upon himself the sins that you committed. Christ took upon himself the sins that I committed. Which means that if we confess our sins and God does not forgive us, and this would mean that God is unrighteous. Because all the sins are paid for. All the sins that you have committed are paid for. All the sins that I've committed are paid for. Not only the past sins, but the present sins and the future sins. So if God does not forgive, he's not righteous. But fortunately, brethren, for you and I, because God is righteous, we have forgiveness. Because God is obligated to be who he is. Because he obliges himself. He forgives us. And a lot of times because we we probably hear this so often. We, we, we get used to it. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven of my sins. But we should often pause and think about what this means. Every single one of us sinned yesterday. Every single one of us sinned last week. Every single one of us sinned last year. Think about this for a moment. You and I deserve to die because we have sinned. Think about this for a moment. You and I deserve to go to hell for eternity because of our sin. Sometimes we put sin on different levels in different categories. We use words like a white lie and we use words like adultery and we say that adultery and a white lie are so different that God will understand if I tell a white lie, but he'll condemn me if I commit adultery. Oh no, he will condemn us for adultery and he, conde he will condemn us for a white lie. Because one lie can send us to hell for all eternity. And how many of us on this platform have ever told a lie in our life? If the answer is yes, that we have told lies in our life, then we deserve, like everybody else, to go to hell. So when this passage says that he is righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, this should give us pause. To think for a moment about his grace and his mercy. That he will forgive us on the basis 
of someone who died in our place. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Moses said about God, all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright. Abraham successfully appeals to God's own character of righteousness when he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? God also speaks and commands what is right. In Psalm 19, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God says of himself, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. It's in Isaiah 45, verse 19. There is a section in the Bible in Exodus chapter 34, when God and Moses have an interaction. And the Bible says in chapter 34, verse 5 to verse 7, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. This is, this is God standing with Moses as Moses is calling upon his name, as Moses is praying. Verse 6, then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for generations, thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. We see this again in Nahum chapter one, verse three. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. We see two aspects of God's nature in that God is simultaneously a forgiving God and a judge who will not leave the guilty unpunished. At this point, I have to say this. Every single sin that has ever been committed, every single sin that is committed, and every single sin that will be committed will be punished by God. All sins will be punished. Either those sins are punished in the people who commit them, or those sins are punished in Christ. But every single sin will be punished. Every single one. I am sure that none of us can fathom and none of us can even imagine how many sins are committed on a daily basis by every single human being who is alive and every single human being who has died and every single human being who will live. Every single sin will be committed. That every single sin that is committed will be judged by God and punished by God. Let me also say this. If there is one sin that is not punished by God, this makes God unrighteous because this would mean that God is condoning sin and letting sin slide. And this would mean that God is not righteous. And this would mean that everything I said for the past three days, God's perfect, the perfection of God's righteousness, the rectitude of God's righteousness, the, the goodness of God's righteousness and God's obligation to his righteousness. None of that matters because God just lets sin slide. But because that is not the case, because God is obliged to his righteousness and God is obligated to judge, God is obligated to forgive because of who he is. 
every single sin will be punished. So this causes us to not only be thankful for God's forgiveness in that the sins of those who are Christians are punished in Christ, but it also should cause us to fear God as our Father. Knowing that there will be judgment for the lost. And this should also give us a sense of urgency to tell those who are lost in sin and tell those who are in darkness to repent, turn from sins, turn to God. Because he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And my favorite part of the lesson as I close, because you know I always have to bring this to the gospel. Not only is God obliged to forgive because of who he is, not only is God obliged to judge sin because of who he is, but God is also obliged to secure his people in salvation because of who he is. He says in his word that none of his sheep will perish. He says in his word that his people are protected by his power until the day of salvation. He says in his word that he who began a good work in you will perfect it to the end. He says in his word that no one can snatch his sheep from his hand. And finally, he says in his word, when one sheep goes astray from the flock, he will leave the 99 to go and find that one. And let me say, he will find that one the Bible says that when he finds that one that has gone, gone astray, he will be more joyous. He will experience more joy over the one that he found that strayed, over the ones that never strayed in the first place. This causes us to have confidence in God because of his obligation to his righteousness. Knowing that we are not Christians today because of our own doing, but we are Christians today because of the grace of God. We are kept by his power. All of us on this platform, maybe some of us can think about a time when you strayed from the flock, when you strayed from the church, when you were deceived by sin. And somehow, you came back. Somehow you repented. Why is that? Is it because of you? Oh, no. The grace of God. The power of God. God who is obliged to keep his people because of who he is. So, brethren, I want us all to think about this. And by way of application, live with gratitude. Live with urgency in evangelism. Live with thanksgiving and thankfulness to God, knowing that our God is obliged to his righteousness and he will keep us, he will forgive us, and he will continue to be who he is because he is not only righteous, but he is also faithful. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for your time. God bless you all. God bless you all. At this time, I'm going to call upon our dear Reverend Clark to was the closing prayer and the benediction. God bless you all. God bless you.